Uh, I, Jeff Wagnitz, I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs and also for the, in this moment, am also Acting President of the College. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to uh, welcome you here, uh, to thank our panelists for taking time to do this. Um, you know, it's a rapidly uh, changing environment in terms of some of the things that are happening uh, on our campuses across the country right now, and some of them very close at hand. I'm sure if you follow the news at all, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and we wanted to have an opportunity today to talk through a bit of what resources, best practices, procedures, the kind of things that Highline has in place today uh, that you can draw on, that you can kind of rely on as, as uh, supports for you as you deal with your students, with the campus, with the community around the college uh, as we try to, try to work through this in a way that respects uh, everyone's rights and keeps everyone safe and keeps the educational purpose of the institution moving forward. Um, so we're going to talk mostly today about what is. Uh, we understand that you know, in any rapidly evolving environment that what's good today and what works today may not be sufficient for everything that might come in the future. And we also are uh, interested and open to the idea of having other conversations beyond today about, okay, that makes sense, but what about this? And so this isn't the end of a conversation, it's the beginning. Uh, again, I just want to thank you for taking time to be here. It's important, and I appreciate your presence. And I also want to, again, thank our panelists. David Menke is our Director of Public Safety. Buzz Wheeler is paralegal faculty. Ace Chow is had a recent title change, but we'll just say Director of TRIO for the moment. <laughs> Gloria Rose Kepping is one of our counselors. And I just met uh, our friend, Sergeant Mike Gradden. Yep. yep, from Des Moines PD, who took time to be here today. So thanks again to our panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to David. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Menke. I'm the Director of Public Safety and Emergency Management. I started in July of last year after retiring from the United States Navy after 20 years of service. Uh, during my time in the Navy, I was a military police officer with experience in law enforcement, security, investigations, and training. Uh, my last assignment was up north at Naval Station Everett, where I was the law enforcement um, I mean, operations manager for the patrol division. So today I'd like to discuss what public safety does and some things that you can do on campus to make yourself safe. So we have a dedicated team of public safety officers. A lot of them have backgrounds in law enforcement, security, and some of them even military. They're here 24-7, every day of the year, holidays, while you're at home having your turkey, they're still here making sure the campus is secured. So uh, very dedicated and some of the finest individuals that I've worked with. So they work out of Building 6, Room 104. So if you ever need anything from Public Safety, we're at Building 6 on the first floor. And if we're not available, you can call us at 206-592-3218. Even if someone's not in the office, it will forward to the cell phone, so they'll pick it up and they can handle any situation that you request. So what do they do? You'll see them out in the parking lot conducting patrols with the vehicle. Um, I know recently we've had some prowlers out there trying to check door handles and they'll be looking through the vehicles, so they're out there trying to deter that. You'll see them walking through the buildings and on the pathways, just deterring crime and trying to prevent theft. That's one of the major things that we have to deal with here on campus with us having an open campus. But they do um, have crime prevention efforts while they're out there. Things that they'll do is stop students and say, hey, is this your backpack? You know, make sure you don't leave this unattended. Or if they see an office open, they might talk to that person that owns that office and just say, hey, make sure you you lock your office when you leave because people have been known to come in there and take an item or two. So that's the biggest thing is just getting the word out there not to give your stuff away for free. Hold on to it. Have somebody that you know watch it. Uh, for the physical security efforts at night, we have our officers at night checking the lighting for the campus. They'll see if a light's out or a window's broken. They'll check the door handles making sure that the buildings are locked, especially in the cold time because we have people that come through here and looking for a way to get out of the cold, so they might just check the doors and see where they can find a, a place for the night. So they're always out there, always checking to make sure the campus is secure. Um, 
when I mentioned the lights, we have um, identified an area that's pretty dark, which is the east lot. So we're working to try to put some more lights in there. Uh, worked with the people that were leasing, and if we can get the funding, we'll make it work. So you should see that in the near future. Um, escorts, we do uh, provide escorts from your car to your class or from your class to your vehicle or pretty much anywhere on campus. The only where, place we cannot escort you is off campus because of liability reasons. And I looked at our statistics and about 100 escorts per quarter. So, you know, you're not bothering anybody by asking. Just, you know, call us up. We can get you anywhere you need if you uh, feel uncomfortable walking by yourself. We can also do individual safety plans. So a lot of times if we have a victim of a crime or they're involved with somebody with harassment or something even off campus, they can sit down with us and we can figure out where their classes are, maybe change up a class if so they're not with the person that the perpetrator of that crime or possibly move them online or it might just be a making sure that they have escorts to their class so each situation is different we'll sit down and try to figure out the safest way to get their education and meet their needs uh, with training and assessments at any time any of the faculty staff even if they want us to come to a class we can provide training on our emergency procedures make sure that everybody understands what to do if an emergency occurs on campus and then we can also do a quick assessment, just make sure, like we did an assessment in 99 and found out that nobody had locks on their offices and we fixed that quick, quickly. So, you know, you can call me anytime, email me and we can figure out a time to sit down. So what can you do on campus to keep yourself safe? In the parking lot, like I said before, we have prowlers. So make sure the doors are locked and make sure you keep your valuables out of sight. So most times we'll have somebody just checking door handles and the problem is with the state law and under the RCW, they actually have to make entry to your vehicle. So if we see them catching the door handle, they're just going to say, oh, I'm looking for my car or I thought this was my car. So there's a quick, easy cover story because we're an open campus. So, you know, if they see something, then they might decide they want to smash your window. That's why you need to make sure everything's out of sight. Uh, personal items, like I said, uh, the problem that we have is people leaving their backpack under a desk. They try to hide it out of the way or they leave their phone on top of their desk while they're trying to go get something off the printer. You need to make sure that you leave it with somebody you trust or that you take it with you because it only takes a second for somebody to snatch it and keep on walking. Uh, I did mention the escorts, but we do recommend that you avoid walking alone, especially at night. So, you know, sometimes people are worried that they're gonna bother us. I mean, we're not really doing any, anything other than making sure we're here for your safety. So that's our job. So please call. Make sure you're safe. And then be aware of surroundings. I know Pokemon Go is a little bit lower on the scale now, but when it first came out, we had people running into other people. They weren't aware of what's going on. And you pretty much make yourself a target by not being aware of what's going on because you don't know if somebody's watching you, don't know what they're doing. They might just come up and try to snatch your phone from you. So just be aware of what's going on or walk in groups if not. So the slide up right now is the daily crime log. This is in our office at Public Safety. It's available for viewing at any time and normally we'll hold 60 days worth of the crime logs up there and even more and we can pull them up if you need. We're looking to put these online so that people don't have to come to us that we can actually see it at any time. But you know, one of the things that we are required to do is provide all the crimes to you, whether they actually happen or allege. So that, that way you know what's out there, you know what to protect yourself from. Next one's the emergency procedures poster. You've probably seen it in the different classrooms and the hallways, maybe in the different buildings. It'd be a good idea to be familiar with the different procedures. And with the poster, it's a lot easier just to see one thing, okay, this is what I need to do, instead of trying to flip through a book or you know, go through an actual book. So these are pretty easy, pretty self-explanatory. And then there's not too much in there so that if somebody can't read it, somebody else could explain it to them quickly. Uh, HC alerts. By uh, showing me your hands, how many people are signed up for AC alerts? All right. If you're not, please go to hctextalerts.highline.edu and sign up. Um, if there's a threat to the campus or the community, we're going to send it out through that. Recently, we had a delayed start because of snow and people showed up and they didn't know that we were delayed because they weren't signed up for text alerts. So if you do have a class, make sure your students are signed up and you know just pass the word. The pens that you um, are on the tables on the sides have the address as well. So if you need the address, take a pen. 
Make sure you sign up, please. All right, so the question that we get a lot about lately is the freedom of speech. And I know on campus sometimes we even have this one male individual that talks about religion, tells people where they're going to go if they don't uh, follow by the Bible. And we get a lot of complaints about it actually, saying that they don't like the message and is he allowed to do that and you need to go stop him. But our campus does believe in the freedom of speech and the First Amendment, so we can't tell one group that they can talk about what they want to and stop another group just because somebody doesn't like it or is offended. So it's open to everybody. The simple th rules are that they can't violate the um, educational process. They can't impede on it. So as long as they're in a public area, they're not being loud, they don't have huge signs or blocking pathways, then they can pretty much put out their mes message. Some of the rules against it, though, are they cannot make a threat to anybody in the community, have anybody feel like they're threatened, so that an actual threat, not just that I'm offended by the message, but I'm actually threatened for my life, or I'm in danger because of what they're saying, or anything that might incite violence. So if they're telling people, hey, we need to go hurt this group of people, that could incite violence, so those are the things that they cannot say. And then just in the general policy, we have recommended areas that we'd like non-student groups to do their First Amendment areas. That way we can just kind of monitor what's going on and make sure they're protected as well as students. So I'm gonna pass on the mic to Buzz, and he's gonna talk about classroom safety, and then afterwards we'll open it up to Q&A. So thank you. So my name is Buzz Wheeler, and I'm the coordinator of the Legal Studies program on campus. And I'm, there are two components to what I want to talk about, and then I, we will take some questions because I unfortunately have to leave and go to a class. Um, the two components that I wanted to talk about is one as a faculty member and actually being in the classroom, and then I wanted to also backtrack just a little bit and talk about our, the background to our Say It, which I hope everybody is well aware of and which Gloria is going to talk about a little bit later on. But in the summer of 2014, nine of us were selected from different parts of the campus community, student services, faculty, di very different parts, to go to a rather intensive training that was several days down in Portland on behavior collectively what's referred to as behavioral assessment teams. Teams that are set up to try to run early interference, if you will, for students who are problematic and perhaps dangerous to try to defuse the situation. We went through that training and then came back and we were organized into a behavioral assessment team advisory committee which operated during the academic year of 2014 to 2015, and I was the chair of that committee. And what we did, it was trying to determine how we wanted our behavioral assessment team to be operative, trying to interact with faculty, staff, and to some degree students to make them aware of this team being developed and what the process would be. And then more importantly, we spent a lot of time and energy in trying to determine a name for it so that it was a, it really modeled what we wanted that and felt that team should be. And so that's what, how we ended up with what's currently referred to as Say It. And there are a lot of different reasons and rationales behind that, but one of the prime one is just the, the term itself, Say It. And we really wanted to promote an idea that if anybody had some concern about a student, to say something about it, to make a report, to say it, to let the people that are trained in how to do intervention and to identify true situations become involved in an early stage. One thing that was telling to me during the time we were meeting with faculty during that time was there were, there were I perceived a, a fair amount of reticence on the behalf of the faculty about making a report of someone that was acting of concern to them. And I think part of that is because of the culture of inclusiveness that we have at Highline and we try to be very respectful of students and we didn't want to take any time of affirmative action that was going to be intim in in intimidate those students. And that was something we tried to work through with, the, with faculty and I still hope that faculty perceive it because the data has proven over time that this is not necessarily a punitive thing, it is an early intervention opportunity 
which allows students that are having issues to get resources and help that they may need. And from an institutional standpoint, it's proven to be very highly effective in retention of students, that oftentimes those students would get lost and would drift away. And then in fact, if you have this early intervention with resources that are available to try to catch those students, it has a higher impact on retention to the college. So there are a lot of positive things that can come about from that. And so I, I just want to plug that I think it's a great tool that we have. And I would rather people use it when it's not really determined to be their forum. At least it allows another set of eyes and resources to be able to look at it and evaluate it. And I always think more than one mind looking at something, particularly those that have training are valuable. So then I'll, let me switch gears just a little bit to clap talking about the classroom. And it, it makes me a little twitchy when somebody says best practices because I don't necessarily think I have best practices. I don't have people running amok in my classroom, but I don't know that my, my practice is necessarily best practices. But to give you a little bit of background, prior to coming to Highline, I was in private practice as an attorney, and my practice area was divorce, you mostly high conflictual divorce, and I practiced for a large amount of time in the Los Angeles area. And because of the nature of the type practice I was in, that is one that has, unfortunately, a lot of violence because of the volatility of the emotions of the people, and so there were attorneys that were injured, there were judges that were injured, and there were parties that were injured or killed during that. And so at every continuing education conference for the law that I went to, there was always a component on safety. And I think that I, tr some of that stuck with me when I came here because as we, it's been talked about already, a large component is being aware, just being aware and alert of the situation and being attentive to what's going on and not, not taking for granted certain occurrences without really making a mental note of them and being attuned to our circumstances. And so I think that means that we just need to be practical. I don't think that we need to be uh, neurotic about it, but I think that one thing we need to do is we need to always know in our classrooms who are the students that are in our classrooms to let them know that we know who they are so that there's not a factor of anonymity, to know where the exits are, and the other thing that from my trial practice background, I always tried to anticipate. When I would go to court, I would always try to think, now what if the other side does this? How am I going to respond? And the more I had prepared and how I might do that, the more I never needed it. But it gave me some assurance. And so I think that we need to try to contemplate if a certain situation is to arise, how am I going to handle it? so that you've at least got a point of reference so that if we're confronted in a situation like that, we know how to react or it's not something we're trying to think about under stress. And the other thing is I think we all have that our faculty have different styles. And <clears throat> my style, because of my background, is more direct and bottom line oriented. And while I like to be inclusive and fun and have fun in the courtroom, in the courtroom, in, in the classroom. <laughs> I think students also know, you know, not to push me. They know what the limits are and what the boundaries are. And I think it's like when you have children or when you're engaging with pets, it's about establishing boundaries and, and promoting respectfulness, that you have respect for the students, that you encourage the students to have respect for one another, and that you encourage the students to have respect for you. And, in, and you know, I've never really had a situation like that. I've had students that have gotten a little testy and you know, you try to deal with them one-on-one -on -one and try to diffuse that. I was trying to think about a time where I really had a student that was kind of problematic and, and the, the one in recent memory was from last quarter. I had a student in the online class who wasn't threatening but who, who emailed me in a tone that I didn't particularly appreciate. And I thought that it was disrespectful and it was not something, I wouldn't have com communicated with her that way. And so I just <clears throat> called her on it. I said, I'm glad to answer any question you have. I don't appreciate your tone when a professional environment and if you'll communicate with me appropriately, I'll be glad to answer any question you have. And then I got another response to that that was slightly less testy but still testy and I just, 
thought to myself, I've already explained to her I'm not going to respond to that. And I didn't. And then the very next day I got a response to her, which was entirely appropriate, as if nothing had ever happened. We went on the rest of the quarter, and there were no issues with her, and she did fine as a student. And so I think that sometimes, I, I know that, that part of our human nature is sometimes when somebody is engaging with us like that, is to keep engaging with them. Because I'm, I always want to have the last word, and that's something I have to work very hard on. That sometimes that's not a good view. Sometimes you just need to let it de-escalate and try to move on. And it worked in that instance. I don't think I have anything else, but if anybody has any questions. You know, one over there. You mentioned um, SAIC. I was just wondering <clears throat> what that stood for. Oh, uh, Gloria. Student Assessment <laughs> and Information. Student <laughs> Assessment and Information, information team. team. You know, that's really not nice. Since we spent all that time trying to think of it, but it's been a while. Student Assessment Information Team. And believe it or not, there was a lot of time spent on what that acronym actually meant. We, we really wanted to try to take behavior and conduct out of it. So that it really was an evaluation and assessment and not sort of insinuating that somebody's actions or conduct was in a was in error. Thank you. Alright, I guess I'm next, yeah? Alright, yes, my name is AC Chow. Yes, I am the trio director. I am also the associate dean for student development retention and conduct, yes. But for today, I'd like to share with you more about kind of my hat as a student conduct officer. So let's see, yes, that's the slide there. So the Office of Student Conduct, we're, we're here to address uh, alleged reports and incidents of student violations of our student conduct code. So it, we're uh, public safety, that's the third kind of problem which they focus on campus safety, our goal is to, it's, it's not campus safety, so if you have definitely a uh, incident or the of concern, we definitely recommend you call campus safety. But if you have a incident where you have a student who violated, which you believe alleged violated one of our stu student uh, violation codes, then that's when you want to submit a report. It is different than our state report, which Gloria will get into, and what uh, was kind of alluded to about the one fall under that. So I'll try to sh share with you a little bit what constitutes a student violation and kind of what the process looks like as well, too. In addition to that, our philosophy in student conduct. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Dr. Curtis. So our philosophy and practice, number one, our, our goal is to balance the rights of our students and also to ensure that we have a safe learning environment for everyone, for you that are, each one of you that are here, for our students and those who are involved in our campus activities. Uh, it is also grounded in extension from learning and student developing, student development, meaning when students come in and they may have violated one of our student conduct codes, our goal is to help teach them how to be a productive member of our community and also to examine the moral and ethical components of their actions and how to, uh, to, how to be involved and how to do it. It's also with that balancing their rights. So the first, as we mentioned, first and fourth amendment, free speech to make sure that we don't have an improper seizure uh, of their possessions or whatnot. It's balancing that as well too. So as you can tell, there's this balance going on to ensure that we have due process in place. So if there is a student conduct violation, an alleged student conduct violation, that we look into it, we investigate it, we examine and meet with the, the student and keep, have them uh, be able to kind of uh, provide their testimony, their, their uh, account of the matter. Uh, we also impose sanctions, but it's based on fair, reasonable, and proportionate to the violation. So it may be a violation of academic dishonesty. There may be other violations of, for example, assault. The sanction will most likely be, of course, appropriate and reasonable and proportional to the violation. So with that, you might be wondering, what are these violations that I've been mentioning? So the violations, so you'll see that list there from academic dishonesty. So that's like, for example, plagiarism uh, in, in your class, uh, obstruction, disruption. Uh, we alluded to the right to free speech, so if there's a student or group outside and they have a little kind of area that they're handing out whatever material, they have every right to do so. But let's say we have someone coming in 
and they're intentionally dis disrupting the classes, going to the classrooms, going to your offices, uh, really disrupting the scenes that you can't get your work done. That is what we refer to as structural disruption. I won't define each one of these. You can find all of these in. If you go to the or go to, go to the Highland website and uh, look and see the kind of code, you won't find the WAC code uh, or student kind of code, which refers to our WAC code that outlines all the violations. But you'll see different cyber misconduct. That's definitely one of the more kind of recent additions to our student violations. Property violations, that kind of speaks for itself when you ban music, uh, bailings on property, whatnot. Failure to comply with directives. So that's, you may, in your classroom, request that the students uh, to step outside to meet you regarding an incident or an occurrence that was inappropriate in class, and they refuse to do so. Or any, maybe a public safety staff is asking for a student who is uh, conducting himself in, in a manner that's inappropriate, but the student refused to comply with the uh, public safety officer. So those are in violation. It doesn't comply with the directive from a high line enforcement act. Weapons possession, that is also a violation as well. Hazing, alcohol, drug, tobacco violation, lewd conduct, discriminatory conduct, sexual misconduct, and retaliation. So uh, there's a full-fledged definition of this missing code, and I'll be happy to take questions about this later as well. So let's say a student does, you witness a student violating one of these student uh, conduct codes. Uh, what question, what do you do next? We would recommend that you submit an incident report. So you can go to our Highline website, uh, our state website, we have this link as well too. If you search student conduct, you'll find it as well. Uh, and this is uh, the page, yes. Uh, the page kind of the top part of the page, where if you go onto our incident report page, you'll find this, it's gonna ask for a lot of information. We would ask you to include as much information and evidence as possible, uh, whether it be written documents or other uh, reports that you have written. So we encourage you, number one, always from, uh, document what you see, right? so it can be as accurate as possible, as soon as responsive as possible. So if an incident occurs, we would encourage you to document uh, as soon as you can, once you have access to some type of written uh, component. Uh, because the longer you wait, the more kind of you may forget. So. And essentially what happens once you submit an incident report, uh, a lot gets done. So once you submit one, uh, we, the student conduct officer, myself, uh, or uh, the office, uh, by the vice president, Tony Castro, student services, our uh, student office of student conduct, one of us will review, or all of us will review the student incident report. We review it, we'll look at the documentation, the notes, any attachments, and in addition to that, <coughs> excuse me, we'll conduct preliminary investigation to determine if this is a student conduct violation or if it, it is a say it, it um, goes more, uh, lines more of a say it uh, process of work crime. So maybe this is, we get an incident report but it's regarding a student who is uh, depressed and has maybe concerns and maybe the staff or advisor met with the student and the student exhibits maybe suicidal tendencies with depression or anger issues and in that case a student has not violated our student kind of code, right? It's okay to be angry, it's okay to be sad, but they don't violate the code, so that goes, we refer that to our SAVE team. Uh, if it is a student conduct, it violates student conduct, and we have evidence uh, as well to that. You know, we'll, if we need more evidence, we'll ask for the uh, prior uh, uh, information. We'll follow up with the student for a formal disciplinary hearing, in which the student, this is our due process, in which our student will have the opportunity to also provide their input, their perspective, the matter and the incident. And then from that evidence, from what was reported from the hearing, uh, we'll have a determined and appropriate sanction. Uh, or if the student is not found responsible for the incident, they'll be exonerated. So that is essentially the, the process and what also is a violation. So uh, I guess we'll take questions at the very end, or is that right? We're going to go down? And, Correct. Okay, so I'll, I guess I'll pass it to Gloria next. Thank you. So my name is Gloria Rose Kepping, and I've uh, worked here at Highline for 28 years. Um, I'm a faculty counselor. That doesn't mean I counsel the faculty, um, but it, um, it does mean that I'm here in that status as a faculty member to provide services to students. Um, and I, and I, I want to talk a little bit about how Say It really works. I think we have a, um, do I have a slide for where the, uh, Thank you. 
So um, this is found on our um, student services webpage, um, but it's also found in security, I think on your page. It's found in a lot of multiple places, so in case you can't find it, you can search for it and it'll pop up, okay? Um, and then where it says to, in red to submit a report to SAT, click here. I'll show you what one looks like at the end if you'd like. Um, but what we do in SAT is that um, we meet every Monday afternoon and kind of, and prior to that we've all gotten um, pinged as they say. Um, we've all gotten little emails that um, say we have to go into Maxient, which is the name of our um, software program and we can read what people have submitted um, as concerns about students or about um, you know an incident on campus um, and then at that point we read through it that's myself Rod Fowers who is um, uh, actually the chair of the SEAT team he's not here I don't think today um, uh, he's uh, semi-retired I think um, but he is chairing our SEAT team so Rod, uh, myself, A, Officer Curtis, and sometimes Dave come. Um, and we all just kind of talk through what's happened, and it's nice because um, there's a number of us, so we have different perspectives, different ideas. We can talk about, oh, does this case really belong you know, somewhere else? Um, if it's um, maybe a classroom management issue, then Rod works with faculty most of the time to help them work with the student to get them to um, you know, behave the way that we'd maybe hope they could behave. Um, if it's more a, a student, uh, we think there might be some mental health issues or some concerns if someone is depressed or anxious or something, then I might take that on um, and meet with the student or connect with the student to help them, you know, negotiate being in the classroom better or their relationships with other students and faculty and staff. Um, and they might need some outside intervention. Um, it might be a police matter <laughs> um, that someone's not noticed, so we might refer off campus for that with the help of security. So um, really we're there to kind of look at um, what, what's the problem, what are the potential solutions, and then which one of us is going to follow up and implement, you know, connecting with either faculty or student, and then get back to the originator. Um, of the report so we can let them know how that kind of played out, okay? Um, there's two, two things, I have a list, maybe we can go to the next page. These are a list of um, where everything fell during fall quarter, and I have to thank uh, Vincent Sanchez for um, compiling this from our cases. You can see, um, let's see, the other column, the biggest column, 21, means that it was either uh, student discipline or, or ju student judicial affairs, that um, a conduct issue that was um, really what was going on, or perhaps it was a Clary um, Act or um, something else, um, Title IX perhaps. So, um, so that's where the majority of things are at. But there are a lot of, as you can see, a lot of academic difficulties, a lot of threatens or engages in violent behavior. Some of that, I'd say most of that fall quarter was towards themselves or maybe towards another uh, student. Um, and then it, then it had both probably components of judicial as well as counseling involved for the people. But this is a nice kind of breakdown. You can just see that, that it kind of runs the gamut. There's a lot of different things there. And, what I really like is that all of us have worked in student affairs long enough um, that we can, we can identify, oh, that's, that's what might be going on, um, and let's see what we can do to intervene with them. I'd put a plug in here now, if I could, to ask you, um, if you can, to be really um, detailed in what you send us on the reports, because the more details you can give us, then the easier it is for us to figure out what we could do or what, what avenue we might have to kind of connect with a student and get them to um, work with us a little um, more closely, okay? So um, why don't we go to the last Oh, I don't have my other slide in there. Um, I had a third slide that just, um, which was like the first slide, only I know the one after this. 
that you where I could click on it, where it said click here, and it would show you the report. Um, apparently that one didn't get loaded, so that's okay. You can go and look on the um, on the page yourself and just kind of familiarize yourself with it. Um, and I think that will that be helpful for you. So I'll uh, answer questions at the end then. Thanks. Okay. Well. <clears throat> You guys are pretty fortunate to have a, uh, a good team here. A lot of the stuff that they talked about, they stole a lot of my thunder that I was going to talk <laughs> about. But I, but I am going to echo what a lot of the things they touched on because what we see in the community really mirrors what you see here on campus. There, there's not much of a difference. When, there's, when we have a heroin problem, it it'll trickles onto campus. When we deal with homelessness, you'll see it on campus. So. Um, but just let me introduce myself. I'm Sergeant Mike Gradden. I'm the Administrative Training Sergeant for the Des Moines Police Department. I've got a little bit of experience working on campuses as uh, I was the school resource officer assigned to Mount Rainier High School for a number of years. And I'm actually very fortunate to also be one of your part-time adjunct faculties here in the uh, criminal justice program. So I'm actually one of two of our police officers who teach here. So it's, uh, it's a great recruiting place for us. And, and it's an amazing opportunity for outreach to interact with, uh, with students and young students who are inspiring to get into criminal justice. Um, so it's, it's very, very rewarding to do that. So we'll talk about um, crime prevention. It is really the most important piece here that I wanna drive home. Your number one reported crime statistic on campus is theft, is petty theft. Whether it's from a classroom, or a cell phone sitting uh, left unattended in the library, or a, a break into your vehicle and theft out of your vehicle. And not only is this the number one crime, but it's also the most um, preventable crime by target hardening, by locking those doors, keeping those items out of view of your car, not leaving your purse you know, in view or in the trunk. Take it with you. Please help us out, partner with us, well, we, can't, we can't do it alone. We certainly need uh, as much help um, from you guys. I'm very encouraged by the amount of people that are here. We, we oftentimes will have these community forums and meetings in neighborhoods and block watches. Um, this actually is a good turnout. So I am very encouraged by the, the amount of people that are here. So thank you very much for being here and participating um, in this. Um, whether you have a concern or a, an argument or no matter what your, your purpose is for being here, thank you. Um, the next slide um, is really be aware of your surroundings, be alert, know what's going on. If you, you walk by somebody, um, make eye contact with them, let them know that you're there, uh, let them know that you see them, make a note of what they're wearing, uh, where they're going. Um, uh, just be watchful is, is really the big message. The next slide, Tr trust yourself, trust your instincts. If you're uncomfortable in a situation, don't put yourself in the middle of that situation. You know, if I go downtown and go to the theater and I need to walk from point A to point B, if I need to walk around somebody that I think is suspicious, I'm gonna walk around. I'm not gonna walk down a dark alley. I'm not gonna walk down a, a dark neighborhood. I'm gonna park my car in a well-lit area. Um, don't put yourself in a situation that's uncomfortable. If somebody is um, preaching the gospel and you're, you're not comfortable with that, or if they've picked a topic that um, really strikes a chord with you, it's best just to, to walk away. Because as they mentioned, we, there's freedom of speech. And um, we're not gonna intervene with that. We're gonna allow people to express their opinions. But if you find it to be hurtful or offensive, just avoid it altogether. And next, um, report. If you're a victim of a crime, please report that. Now, now putting it on Instagram is not a police report. <laughs> P putting it... <laughs> on Facebook or Snapchat or whatever other means next door. Um, we don't have the luxury of, uh, of going through and reading all that as much as we should because it's, it's information about what's going on in our community. But please get that police report to us, to the school. And the reason is it helps us figure out what we're gonna do with our resources. How are we gonna allocate our resources? Where are we gonna put our officers during their downtime? Where are we going to, where are we having issues? Okay, and without those reports, we can't do much about it. Now, the next slide. Um, 
how, how do you make a police report? It can be done in a, in a number of ways. Um, you can simply call 911. You can re report it to the school. If you want to be anonymous, you can report it online. We have an online reporting system, which a lot of our, our crimes, such as petty theft or vandalism, uh, are reported online and an officer may not necessarily come out. That is really just a, a resource thing. Uh, it allows our officers to be spending more time um, on our more serious instances, like maybe an accident or a robbery or something. Um, you can report them online. You can even come into the police station. We are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you can come and, and speak with an officer there um, who'd be happy to, to take a report. But that's very important. I can't um, stress that enough. What's going to be asked of you when, you when you do call 911? Don't be offended, but they are going to ask who you are, your, your name, your birth date. That is all just for information so we can contact you or maybe find you uh, on campus. Um, we are not going to ask your um, immigration status, okay? Uh, we, we are not going to ask that that's as useless to us as your religion or your uh, financial status, okay? So we, we are here to serve everyone, witnesses, victims, suspects. We're going to treat everybody the same. But when we ask you that information, our dispatch is going to ask you that information. It's confidential. Um, and, and that's information just for us to, to make sure that we can complete the report and investigate it uh, to the best of our ability. Okay? And uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. I think we move on to questions and answers now. And said a student came to class wearing a t-shirt that said socialism is for fags. And, and then has made the, their canvas picture, a picture of them wearing socialism is for fags t-shirt. So my question to you, is that a conduct violation? Is that a say it appropriate question? Or is that a free speech and you get to say whatever insulting thing on your shirt that you want to? Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I would definitely recommend is that if you see uh, any kind of activity that you have a certain topic, you can always submit this report. Number one, oh, we can always submit this report. And for that, we can determine if it is conduct, because it, it really is in the details. We're determined, well, okay, that person, it just be that they actually acted on it, where they did something harmful to someone else. So we have to look at the details to determine exactly what it shows. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. What would you determine? <laughs> where would it go? Do you know off the top of your head if it's a conduct violation or not? Just if a student has a shirt and it says, like, for example, we've seen this before, uh, Obama is Hitler. That's it's not a common violation. We can't, that's free speech. Um, it's, there, the question was there a discriminatory act? And number two is, was there harassment? That's why it, it depends on the actions after with that, and what were the actions. So we take all the information together. Um, now, there is discrimination. That discrimination based on the act. What did this person do? It is where the sign. So we would have to look into that further. And so, who can get on? Elsa, you couldn't use a better example yeah. that is really a complex one, and I really didn't mean that all of the above. Yeah. Um, in my decades of doing student conduct and this understanding of free speech, that is um, one exercise in there. Um, and are we offended by that given our community? Absolutely. Um, but being offended is different than a intentional threat to harm somebody or somebody feeling harm. Um, I'd say it could um, get reported to both student conduct and say it. I would say it would probably fall under the say it report. And as educators and administrators who are committed to upholding the mission and values of I would think that those of us on say it might um, have a plan to, to have a conversation with the student to let him or her know how that is in conflict with the environment um, here.
parties that happen across the university and college campuses across America, and are they exercising their right to free speech to have um, self important parties? And that's a real case that happened at the University of Santa Clara. While it's offensive to those of us who may be members of the community, they, they didn't intentionally <coughs> Um, I kind of have a, a related concern, I think, or it's, it really is kind of the same. Um, I guess one, one place to start, and I just first want to start with thank, um, saying thank you for this panel, and um, thank you for the, the work a lot of you, Tony and David especially. I think we have a really um, strong protocol for, for dealing with these kind of things. I'm coming at this, I have to be honest, I'm a faculty member here in the English department. Um, I was also on campus last Friday night at the University of Washington, and I was about 10 feet away from the person who was shot. Um, and as a University of Washington alum, that's where I got my PhD, um, I also live just up the block from there. Um, I've been concerned for months, um, especially months, even years in some sense, about the, the protocol that they have there, and I think this was an extreme, I mean, I have to say, a complete failure in a, a number of fronts with, obviously, how to deal with this when you end with a student Sorry, when you end with um, a community member who actually worked at the university who shot um, nearly, nearly dead in critical condition, and then the shooter surrendered himself to the police a number of hours later and was released without charges, something's not working. Um, there's a lot there, and I, I think a lot of it isn't necessarily of interest here because I think we're leagues ahead. But I think part of what happened there that's a challenge faced by all of us is that is, it's what's already come up. It's this question about when is it speech and when is it threat. Um, and it's not any easier that a lot of the people who kind of make a profession of this are quite aware that we're kind of tangled up in this thing and they dance on that line as much as they possibly can. Um, and I think I can say I was in conversation with the administration at the University of Washington and they were just kind of, they were scared of the question. Um, and so they, they kind of avoided the question, which is, I think, why they ended up with the situation they got. I think here we're not, and I think that's really essential and really important. But, um, you know, what's tricky is the, for example, there are some neo-Nazi flyers that went up on campus just days leading up to that event. Um, I, among a number, there were a number of UW, UW professors that presented those to the administration. Um, and the, the flyers said things like, Seattle needs a cleansing, they said, I'm sorry for the offensive language, but just to let you know what was up, they said, gas the kikes. They said, we need a race war now. And the administration felt that those were not a palpable physical threat and could not be connected to the event. What's interesting is I can see by a narrow interpretation how that could be, because there was no, nothing written about the event on the flyer. But by another interpretation, commonsensically, of course there was. It was leading up to this high tense situation. Um, less clearly even than that, the, the speaker himself, Milo Yiannopoulos, and a lot of the symbols used by people showing up for those events, such as if you're interested in, I think we should all know about the new symbols that are being used by these movements. Pepe the Frog, it sounds silly, it looks kind of silly, but it's actually sort of the new swastika. Um, or the set of three parentheses called the echoes, usually that are put around people's names. These are kind of the new symbols of hate speech, 
but they know that we don't have the precedent necessarily. They know that they're sort of skirting the, our rules and that we know how to deal with these. So we're just all faced with challenges, I think, um, in how to respond to these things. And I think what matters in moments like this is if we can, if we can show leadership, if we can um, look back at the precedent, see what applies, look at the parts that are missing and what we have to kind of make the argument and fill in ourselves. But I think um, I'm confident, I'm really happy to hear that we've had a number of conversations and I think there's a really forward-looking attitude about this, recognizing these challenges. And I'm just um, glad to be here as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McPherson. And if I can just add, you know, if there's uh, events that would lead up to something like that, we have a really good relationship with Des Moines PD. Uh, Commander Sellers in the back row, communicate with them all the time, and it's a lot of uh, information sharing. So as things progress, we would definitely be talking to DMPD, working with the exec staff, and you know, filling everybody in on what's going on, so that it's not like what happened at UW and nobody was prepared or you know, it got handled inappropriately. So, thank you. Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I don't know that that, um, <coughs> whether we do that or not um, is really something for, um, I think, the different constituency groups to sort out with administration. Um, but I don't know that anything, even if we did that or didn't do that, I don't know that anything would change. We already have codes of conduct for all of our groups <laughs> to be nice to be nice to each other and to, you know, so you're, I don't. There's no teeth in it. it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't, it doesn't change. It, it's it's not going to change how we interact on the Say It Committee. You know, if you, if you target someone because of their, even now, because of their, you know, status or their ethnicity or something like that, that's not going to be um, uh, tolerated here at the college. So we'll get that person help and assistance and let them know what their options are. Yeah, the thing with, so that, that kind of goes on the, I guess the, I don't want to use the jurisdiction, or how yeah. we operate. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely, a, you, know, you have to talk about that as a campus, uh, administrators as well too. Uh, but when it comes to the safety of our students, is what ladies need to lead to protecting our students is that yes we should protect our students. We have matters of confidentiality with the mm -hmm. student meets with the counselors with us. We have purpose as well to protect our students' information. Uh, we have those systems set in place. Uh, so if someone does come here and ask for our students' information, private information without any written official like, subpoena or document, then we cannot give it to them. Uh, our campus or any other campus for that matter. Um, so, but where we designate and define what, for us, what a sanctuary college is, that has to be a conversation that uh, needs to take place, I would say. If that's our interest and where we want to go, that, that requires for, for the dialogue. Yeah. Dr. Scarry? I just want to mention that there's actually, um, there's a group, um, that I'm working with, that's collaborating with faculty, senate, and is actually talking about this issue. We already have things, I mean, all the things that uh, protect students are how we operate, um, but there is interest in calling some of those out to make sure we be very specific um, on what we can do and what we can't do. Um, as far as the as far as the declaration, there's not a consensus there. Um, but there is an effort in place. Hmm. Another related thing, I think it's a little bit of a tangent, but, but is it related to that? make some long overdue changes in the uniform application so that it doesn't either overtly or inadvertently capture information about students that the current environment we think is private. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the questions on there were put on there in the early 90s and you know today we just really don't want to know some of that stuff. So I think we'll, uh, what's another way that we can protect students from uh, revealing personal information? 
All right, I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out of their day to join us today. And if you have any other questions that come up later, feel free to email us or give us a call and send it to us. So, thank you. Thank you.